welcome to Go Reflection Part 2. And if you're joining us now, please check out the first video, Part 1, because I am picking up sort of exactly where I left off in that video. Before we get started, um, if my voice sounds a little bit different, well, I'm a little bit under the weather, so hopefully it's not too bad. I think it's okay for me to cover the material. Heads up, that's what's going on. All right, so let's jump in. Like I said, I'm picking up from where we left off the last time. Let's open up part two exercises. So the first thing I want to start with is sort of where we left off. Close this up here a little bit. And so to review, what we said is that if you have a variable of type interf empty interface, is you can assign it different values. So in this example on line seven, we're assigning the floating point value to our interface variable x and our empty interface variable x. And we can pull out the type or that information is not lost even though this is an empty interface. And we can confirm that by asking what type is that value in x and we'll see it should say that it's a float 64 and we could also get the value. And we can create a variable using this the value that's stored in our empty interface variable and goo will be not of type interface empty interface but rather a float 64 and have the exact same value and type of what we stored here and we demonstrate that by also changing the value in our empty interface variable x and again show so we can create another variable with the correct type and so if i run this now if you don't have code runner install well, it's just a plugin that you can add by clicking here. And the nice thing about it is that I don't have to use the command line for a single file Go application or if I run, run some code. It runs code from other programming languages also. So I'll just use that for today and click Run. And you can see it opened up this little window, output window here. And we can see that the type of X is float64 and the value is 3.14, which is exactly what I stored in there. When I created the variable goo, it also had the correct type of float64 and the value 3.14 because that is what is reading out of the variable x. And again, we can see that who is also created with the correct type and value. Okay, so that is a quick review. So the key takeaway from our part one was that when you have a variable that is of an empty interface, you can assign different values to it because it seems that the variable has two hidden fields or properties and those fields would you might call them the value to represent the value that what you're assigning a copy of the value you're assigning and a type that records what type of thing that you have assigned to it and so what we're seeing here when we're able to assign a floating point value to x and then later a struct value or pointed to a struct value is really what we're doing is updating those two hidden fields we're not actually changing the type of x itself x type still remains as an empty interface and so we're able to sort of prove that by doing a type assertion which says basically if i have an empty interface value what i can do i can ask it for a the value of a particular type by specifying what type we want. And so now we will change to looking at how to use reflection to get that information. The drawback with using type assertion is that you have to guess or know or be pretty sure of what type of value is stored in that interface variable. Because if you, or the empty interface variable to be specific, because if you ask for something that's not in there, your program can crash. Of course, we also saw that there's a way for you to ask for a Boolean value that says, tell me if I'm correctly sincerely. And so we can do that. Or we can use the type switch, which is what we use for our simple println function. And that was in exercise five of part one. And what we saw is that if we do a type switch, then we can have this switch these cases that represent the types that we want to check for. Unfortunately, it does not work for types that we do not know because 
we will have to know every type that we want to check and if this is a function that we need to add to someone else who is going to use it with their type that we have never seen well this is not going to work so that was the drawback and that's a quick review so let's continue so let's come back to our ex second example of part two and we start off with an empty interface variable x we assign it a value but if you look on this line instead of trying to use a type assertion instead what we're doing is we're asking the reflex package calling the type of function in the reflex package and giving it our interface variable or empty interface variable and what it will do is return for us a value of the type reflect that type and what type is what reflect the type is it's just a struct that hides some details about how go represents a type and they have also attached some methods to it and those methods allow us to do some very nice things with whatever this type information is for whatever is stored in our variable and similarly there's also a reflect that value um, type and we can get the value that or a type that represents the value of our variable by calling the value of method i know that's sort of like an handful but basically if you think of these two functions type of and value of as being able to look into our empty interface variable and access essentially that hidden type field that I mentioned but it's not really there we don't know but that's one way of thinking of it and this guy access the hidden value field of our variable then that is what is happening it's going and pull back peel away and get to those in fields that I mentioned and we sort of re return some sort of representation for it okay so once we have that now we can say well what is the type of x and we don't have to ask the printf function to tell us the type by using percent um, capital t instead we have that information already in our variable t which represent the type of our value that was passed in so we can simply print that out and we have the value represented in v so we can print that out now and so we come down here and do the sort of the same thing and so if we run this code it's going to be exactly like we had before the exact same result and as you can see here x type is 64 float 64 and the value is the same and we got the type using reflection instead of type assertion which is what we were doing before right or asking the printf printf um, function to get it for us now we're getting that directly and notice we can get whatever the type is also using reflection so let's continue because I don't want this video to be too long again. So let's sort of pick up the pace. So let's continue with the second, third example. And what I've done here is created a pointer to a literal value. And this is for its type is a anonymous, is a struct with an, just a single field called name of type string. And again, I'll do reflect the type of that and the value of it. Now, when we print this out, you should of course expect that the type should be something, you know, pointer to the struct and so on and the value. Then here I have a new string as the thing I'll be creating. And so this is going to be a pointer to a string somewhere in memory. And I reflect that and of course print out the type. So again, we should expect pointer to type. Now, before I get into this code, let's just run that and make sure we see what we expect. And then I'll talk about the few lines that I've just uncommented. And of course, this is consistent with what we expect. You know, we have type um, pointer to struct and pointer to string. Okay, great. So let's go back to the code and let's uncomment this and then talk about it further. So I've stored the types for each of these different values in their own variable t0 and t1. And if we ask the types, what kind are they? The kind is sort of, think of the 
kind as a super type. Now, I was trying to depict this with some graphics, and then I realized that the graphics is probably um, going to be a little bit more distraction and more complicated than what it actually is. It's not as complicated as it might first seem. And so I'll run this, and then we'll look at the documentation for what a kind is. So let's just run this. If we look, we'll see it all the kind for both of our types. So type zero, whose type is actually a pointer to a struct, its kind is a pointer. So kind, like I said, is that super type if you want, or that super the um, categorization for types. And so even though you might have something with different types, those type might fall into the same kind. And so here we see that our, a pointer to a struct and a pointer to a string are the same kind of things because they're both pointers. Let's say I did a zero colon equals to um, a five element array of int. And then I said a one colon equal is a 10 element array of int, right? Or even I say this is uh, float 32, for example. Well, I need to create a value, so the literal value, so that's fine. And so this is um, this is a five element array of int, and this is a 10 element array of float 32. So they're very different types, but they're the kind, they're both arrays, okay? Compared to, let's say, if I were to do something like, let's just do this, S, S. If I did that and I made these into slices instead. So here, well, we know how this is not quite going to work. I have to make a slice, but so if I did that, if I did that, we can see that these are our, our different slices. This is a slice of int, this is a slice of float 32, but even so, they're both still slices. And so that's what the kind refer to, is, the, is that higher categorized category to which they belong. And so let's go take a look at the reflection documentation. And so if we go to the reflect package documentation, and we go to overview and then we look at type kind. You can see the kind that it says a kind represent the specific kind of type that a type represents. So um, just remember that type is also a type. So we have lowercase type as in this, and we have this type uppercase as a type that was def that's defined in this reflection package. And that is what we get when we do type of calling the type of function it returns a value of this type and so it represents that and so the zero kind is not a valid kind so every value that goal can manipulate or use falls into one of these kind and you can see them in your screen right now this is all of them so regardless of what type of array just like i showed in that example even when i add a five element array or a ten element array of different are the type elements, they're still kind array. Similarly, channels, all channels are just going to be kind channel. Every function you've ever seen, main function, regardless of how many parameters, regardless of how many things it returns, its kind is still going to be function. And so you start to get the picture, right? Pointer, again, regardless of what the pointer is pointing to, it kind is a pointer. And of course, you can then say, well, okay, I have a pointer to int, and now I need to treat it like Int on saying int or on saying or uh, int value, but at first it is kind pointer. And so, with that in mind, let's look at another example. So, our fourth example. And so, it seems like I'm beating this to death, but I just want to really drive it home. And so, this sort of hopefully makes it clear. So, we have a string value which we assign to x. Then we have this new type that we've created called ID, and its underlying type is a string. And so we create that and assign it to X. Now, this is a very different type. But if we ask what kind of thing those two things are, 
they are both still string even though they're very different types and so we'll see their types are different but their kinds will be the same so if i run this we'll see that we have a string and it, this is its value and then we have main id as a different type this is its value but notice that both of these have kind string and that makes sense because when we are let's say using reflection to use a value of type main id if we know that its kind is string that sort of help us in how we can manipulate that value even though we don't know what the exact type is because the kind of string well we can treat it like a string and so that that is one of the reason why being able to know the kind really helps you in being able to peel away at the onion that might represent a very nested type okay so the last example is sort of using this idea but what i want to do is a function that prints out information about a structure which is all the fields and its type so let's look at the implementation of the function so let me close this to give us some more room so the first line of the function is straightforward just simply getting the type of this value but because this function on expects to print fields from a struct if the kind of whatever the value is passed in is not a struct I want to print an error message and of course return because there's nothing else I can do in this function right so t that kind not equals to reflect that struct remember reflect that struct is that constant that we saw um, defined as one of the possible kinds okay? and so I return so that's straightforward and that's easy now that we once we're at line 34 we're definitely dealing with some kind of struct we don't know the exact details of the struct but it is a struct that's what we know for sure and so because of the struct it can have any number of fields you can have zero fields because you can have an empty struct or it could have greater than zero and so we get the number of fields and so we say we have a struct of whatever type that struct is right which will give the specific type based on the value so this is if you want to create a value of this struct what is the type you need to use and so we print that out and then we also print out how many fields are in this struct and then for each field we iterate notice we can say t that num field now this you you must be careful when you use reflection because when you have a type there are a number of methods that are attached to a type but not all of them are valid always it depends on what the type is so notice that num field returns a struct's type field count. It panics if the kind is not a struct. So if you were to store any other value here, that's why we had to check and make sure that it's of the kind struct. Because if we try to call this on, let's say, integer value or floating point value, these values don't have fields. So it makes sense that how this call should panic. And so a number of other ones are like that too. There's if you have a reflect a certain type for a function, for example, that type could tell you how many input parameters the function takes, how many output parameters, but you cannot call, you know, to get the number of in and number of out on a struct because a struct doesn't have in parameter and out parameters, right? So make sure that you just read the documentation. And once you go through the documentation, you start playing with this a little bit. It is not as intimidating as it first seems, but just start doing the simple examples like I did here first, and then get your sea legs on those. And once you can sort of understand what we've covered so far, I guarantee you that you will be ready to tackle the rest of the documentation. It's a little involved, but it's still detailed. And so, all right, so now that I know that I have a struct and I could get the number of field, now I can ask about the information for a given field and notice what I'm asking for is a value of struct field and so this now returns more information about a field because once we're dealing with a struct each one of those fields have a lot of things you can have the name the type whether it's anonymous whether it's um, it has um, tags associated with it and so that is exactly what we use now to say well, I want to print out field whatever for this struct, its name and its type. And so hopefully this is sort of a very straightforward example. In the 
part three, we'll see how we can use this information to then print out any structure in the way that our, the go printer function does it. And as you could basically see that we have all, everything we need to be able to do that. We have the type of the structure and we have the field and we have the type. All right. So in main, what I do is to test my function. I pass a float value and we should expect that to say that, you know, I cannot really process this, but then I pass a value of this person value struct and a value of this proto struct. Now, since our function is not taken into account pointers, I could have checked and say, oh, if it's a pointer, is that pointer to a struct? And then if it's struct, then I can also still process it. But that's something else we, we can do. But in this example, I want to keep it very simple and just deal with struct values. And so let's run this. And if we expand, we can see that, yes, we get the error. This is not a struct. And then for the first struct, we see it how it's main that person and it has one field and that field has the name name and type string. For a second um, struct value, it's main that proto, it has four fields. And those four fields are source, destination, size, and magic. And notice their types, string, string, unsend, int, int. So that just tells us that uh, we can use reflection to get at all these things. So I like to end it here because otherwise oh, it's gonna be very long. Uh, take care and see you in the next video. Uh, have a great day. Bye. Thanks for your time.